Good morning and welcome everybody on this, the first Sunday after Trinity, as we continue to celebrate the triune nature of our God and dedicate this time outside our great festivals to our own spiritual growth and nourishment, a mirror of what we see happening in nature at this time of year. Today, we hear Jesus defend the kingdom of God and we consider our own place within that as Christ's brothers and sisters. Glory to the holy and undivided Trinity. God who is three in one and one in three. Who is beyond us, among us, within us. Who was and is and is to come world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We have too often exchanged the worship of the living God for idols of our own imagining. As we gather to offer our praises to the holy and undivided Trinity and to worship God in spirit and in truth, let us call to mind our sins. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of God's glory. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a person of unclean lips. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Your guilt is taken away and your sin forgiven. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins, heal and strengthen you by the Spirit and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen.
Let us pray. Holy God, look down in mercy upon your church at this time. Provide her with faithful laborers, with a true compassion for the souls committed to their care. Give a blessing to our labors that we may share the gift of faith and draw others to the fire of your love. Amen. The reading from 1 Samuel. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that he was wearing and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him. As a result, Saul set him over the army and all the people, even the servants of Saul, approved. As they were coming home, when David returned from killing the Philistine, the women came out of all the towns of Israel, singing and dancing, to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they made merry, Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. Saul was very angry, for this saying displeased him. He said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed thousands. What more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day on. The next day, an evil spirit from God rushed upon Saul, and he raved within his house, while David was playing the lyre as he did day by day. Saul had his spear in his hand, and Saul threw the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. But all Israel and Judah loved David, for it was he who marched out and came in, leading them. Then Saul said to David, Here is my elder daughter, Mirab. I will give her to you as a wife. Only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, I will not raise a hand against him. Let the Philistines deal with him. David said to Saul, Who am I and who are my kinsfolk? my father's family in Israel, that I should be son-in-law to the king. But at the time when Saul's daughter Mirab should have been given to David, she was given to Adriel the Mahathalite as a wife. Now Saul's daughter Michael loved David. Saul was told, and the thing pleased him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. And the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him. For people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, 
but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Before I begin my sermon in earnest, I'd like to say how pleased I am to be able to join with you through the miracle of Zoom. It seems almost too wonderful to think that I can be in Oxfordshire and Edinburgh at the same time. It occurred to me, of course, modestly, that bilocation has always been seen as an indication of sanctity, but I regret to say that those charged with ascertaining sanctity probably don't think that bilocation via Zoom counts. May it be given me to speak in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. A week ago today, we were encouraged by the church to squint momentarily into the dazzling uncreated light which surrounds the great and wonderful mystery of the Holy Trinity. In doing so, we were invited to abandon all earthly cares, all earthly conceptions, all earthly logic, and simply to believe that God is unity, that God is Trinity, that God is infinitely still and unchanging, and that God is supremely dynamic, the three persons of the Trinity joyfully dancing with each other in an eternal round of joy, peace, mutuality, and love. Today, we're brought down to temporal realities with something of a bump when Jesus warns his followers and warns us about the danger of division, whether domestically or within a wider context. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand, he warns. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. We move from the glorious unity of the Holy Trinity in which three infinitely powerful persons are held together by nothing other than divine courtesy, to use the terminology of Dame Julian of Norwich, to the reality of human brokenness in which division and separation, things which seem almost endemic to our human condition, deprive us of unity and ultimately of joy and flourishing. In many respects, I don't think there's an easy answer to this problem, for the problem of division, of suspicion, and of regarding the other with fear and trepidation is probably as old as the human race. But at the same time, the gospel encourages us to acknowledge the cost of this problem, as to quote Philip Larkin, man hands misery on to man. So what's the answer? How do we at least try to avoid the division and unhappiness about which the Lord warns us in the gospel? Well, to that, I want to return to where I started, namely with the Holy Trinity. The Trinity is, as I said, a perfect model for society, whether divine or temporal. God is above all things, a God of relationship and encounter, a divine unity in which three entirely different personalities are united in love and mutuality, completely unthreatened, in fact, by the difference of the other. The Holy Trinity holds together in unity, not because it's the same, but because the differing characteristics of the three persons are not problematic. They're absorbed in infinite love, and they simply delight and rejoice in each other's presence. Meister Eckhart noted, when the father laughs at the son and the son laughs back at the father, 
that laughter gives pleasure, that pleasure gives joy, that joy gives love, and that love is the Holy Spirit. So we might say the answer to human division and brokenness is simply to model the divine life of the Holy Trinity, to love above all things and not to fear difference, to so love and delight in the other that we want her or him to flourish in exactly the same way we flourish, to experience joy to the same degree as we experience joy, and to live in security and comfort to exactly the same degree as we live in security and comfort. But wait a moment. This is all very well, but it is also supremely difficult, and we shouldn't for an instant underestimate the cost of embodying this sort of divine love. For the depth and generosity of this love, the divine love which burns at the very heart of the Holy Trinity, inspired God to empty God's self, to take the form of a servant and to accept death upon a cross. The divine love of the Holy Trinity is not a pleasant, fuzzy, cost-free love. It is a fierce and challenging love, which rather than glowing gently, burns with a fierce and unquenchable fire. The love of God doth burn ere it doth transform, as St. John Henry Newman noted in the Dream of Gerontius. So how do we, as human beings, begin to model this awesome love? How do we avoid the sin and division warned against by Jesus in the gospel and embrace each other and all people in a love which speaks of total mutuality, of total acceptance, of total courtesy, and of complete respect? There are many answers to that, but the one I think uh, is most fundamental is that we begin to realize and strive to accept in ourselves how much we are loved by God. If we can begin to realize that divine love for and in ourselves, then we can become a conduit for it in our homes, in our wider society, and in our world. On Friday, the Anglican Franciscan family celebrates an important feast, the Feast of the Divine Compassion, which is celebrated on the same day as our Roman Catholic sisters and brothers celebrate the Feast of the Sacred Heart. The feast is extremely important to us, for as we celebrate it, we give thanks for the first men to reawaken the charism of St. Francis in the Church of England following the Reformation. And this they did through a religious community, which they named the Society of the Divine Compassion. Centered around a rather dilapidated house in Balaam Street in Plasto in East London, the SDC brothers lived and ministered alongside the poor and dispossessed, intentionally identifying with them in their poverty, in their concerns, and in their brokenness. Their ministry, which eventually centered around the rather beautiful church of St. Philip in Plasto, was phenomenally demanding and costly for each one of them, and they encountered great opposition and suspicion, not only from those to whom they were trying to minister, who were not fondly disposed to the church, nor the church to them, but also from the church authorities themselves, who were very uneasy about the rather strange Anglo-Catholic plants then springing up all over England's green and pleasant land. How did the brothers do this? How did they sustain this very costly ministry? And the answer is that each one of them had encountered the indescribably wonderful love of Jesus Christ, the divine compassion, and this daily encounter with the risen Christ in prayer and service enabled them to continue to persevere and to conquer not with force, never with force, but with unassailable love and divine compassion. 
The work of the Society of the Divine Compassion formally ended in the 1930s, when the three male Franciscan communities and the Church of England united in the Society of St. Francis, of which I am a brother. But their ministry is continued faithfully by my brothers of the Society of St. Francis, who continue to work alongside the people of Plasto, intentionally identifying with their concerns and trying to answer whatever need may present itself, whether it's replacing a light bulb for someone who finds themselves unable to do so, or going to court to advocate on behalf of someone caught within the Byzantine immigration system. Like their SDC forebears, my brothers do so fortified by their own knowledge of the love of the Saviour, whom they encounter in the faces of those to whom they minister, in the beauty of creation, in the Holy Scriptures, in silence, and above all, in the Holy Eucharist. As St. Paul writes in his second letter to the Corinthians, it is the love of Christ which urges us on. Over the next few months, I believe that we will all have to work extremely hard to manifest this divine and costly love in our homes, in our churches, in our communities, and in the world. At present, and we can only say at present, we believe that there will be a final relaxation of the restrictions placed on our lives in order to limit the spread of the coronavirus within the next few weeks. For some of us, this will be a time of intense celebration. For others, and I count myself amongst this group, it will be a time of renewed fear and uncertainty. It may be that we find ourselves holding very differing views from our families, our friends, and the wider society in which we all live. What's comfortable for others may well not be comfortable for us. Others may be happy to do things in a way which feels difficult and dangerous and unwelcome to us. But whatever decisions we make, whatever, states, uh, whatever steps are taken as a society, let's just strive to manifest that divine courtesy which holds together the persons of the Holy Trinity in mutual love, in joy, and in adoration. And let us, like these brothers of the Society of the Divine Compassion, drink deeply of that well of love for ourselves so that we can pour it into the world around us, a world challenged and broken by great suffering and sorrow, and so much in need of that divine compassion, that love of Jesus Christ. So let me finish with some words written by Saint Alphonsus Liguori in the 18th century. O bond of love that dost unite the servants to their living Lord, could we dare live and not requite such love, then death were meet reward. We cannot live unless to prove some love for such unmeasured love. Amen. We join together to affirm our faith. I believe in a God who created all things and seeks for all to be in communion as God's people. I believe in Jesus Christ who showed us how to share love and who commissioned us to go out into the highways and byways, inviting all to be a part of God's work in the world. I believe in the Holy Spirit, who leads and guides us into the world, then touches the lives of those around us, 
in ways that make them receptive to love. I believe in the harvest and the call for labourers to receive and respond, sharing light and life with the world. Amen. The response to each bidding is, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the presence of the Lord, let us pray. For the people of God, that everyone may be a true and faithful disciple, learning more fully the ways of Christ for our community and culture. Root us, establish us, and unite us in your love. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. For the leaders of our country, that they would lead with compassion and wisdom. We also lift to you all who lead our churches here in the benefice and all those in the wider church. Fill them with your spirit and anoint their ministries. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For the beautiful and diverse creation that you have given us, that we may take better care of it. Help us, Lord, to stand against injustice, greed and poverty. In your loving mercy, raise up the fatherless, the orphan and the widow. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear and open hands to give. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For your blessing on all young people, and especially those in our community. Meet them where they are and surround them by your love. We give thanks for young disciples and for the children's ministry. We pray for the visit of our youth worker and schools chaplain to our benefice on Monday, and for the two bids being considered this month to extend the project to up to four years. Give those involved in these decisions wisdom and vision for the future of the young people of Whitney. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who are hungry and sick, persecuted, lonely or ignored, that you will comfort and sustain them. We especially pray for those affected by the terrorist attack in Burkina Faso. We also pray for an end to the coronavirus pandemic. We give thanks for those who have lived and died in faith, commending them to your care and praying for those who face the difficult adjustments of bereavement. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Peace to you from God our Heavenly Father. Peace from his son, Jesus Christ, who is our peace. Peace from the Holy Spirit, the life giver. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us offer one another the sign of peace.
made in God's image and formed by God's love, let us pray in the spirit as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Jesus, we believe that you are present in the blessed sacrament. We love you above all things and we desire you in our souls. Though we cannot receive you in bread and wine, may we now still receive you in our hearts. Trusting in your gracious presence, we welcome and embrace you, and we rejoice in the promise that nothing can separate us from your love. Amen.
Lord of the harvest, we pray that you would inspire and equip us to respond to your call, that by your grace, we may live out our faith in the world by defending human life and caring for the poor and vulnerable in our local, national, and global communities. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, the Holy Trinity, and the blessing of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Jesus, to Many thanks to everybody who's taken part in today's service and particular thanks to Brother Joseph Emmanuel um, from Scotland. Um, fantastic to have you with us. Um, and it was um, terrific. So um, thank you so much. It was uh, as ever a great joy. Um, my only sadness is I can't now wine and dine you in Thanksgiving, but um, we'll send something in, in gratitude to you and uh, many thanks and blessings upon you, brother. Do please be praying um, tomorrow for the candidate who is coming to explore the post of schools chaplain and youth worker. Um, really exciting that she will be with us in the benefits tomorrow and she'll be going around visiting the churches, um, going into a school and doing a collective worship and spending time with the ministry team. Um, so do please hold her in your prayers and um, that whole process um, as we prepare for that next exciting stage. 
Um, my sincere apologies um, for the mess up last week over the music. Um, I'm really delighted that Paul and others at Holy Trinity in the choir had um, gone to great troubles to record things um, and there was a technical hitch and I was away at the wrong time and apologies for that. Um, hopefully we'll be able to have Holy Trinity choir and Paul um, do another recording at a suitable time um, to replace that one. So my, my great sorry for that. If you'd like to book in with Michelle to attend one of our church services this week, they are on Tuesday the 8th when we keep the feast of Thomas Ken at 11 o'clock at Holy Trinity, uh, Wednesday the 9th at 10 o'clock at Minster Lovell keeping the feast of St Columba, um, and then next Sunday the two 9.15 services are at Minster Lovell and Holy Trinity um, before of course our Zoom service um, next Sunday and of course we have our midweek Eucharist online at 12 noon on Thursday um, so you're very welcome to join us for that if you are able to. This week on Thursday evening at 7 p.m. we also have our second session on Julian of Norwich uh, and you'd be really welcome to join me with that if you'd like to explore a little bit more about Julian of Norwich. We had a very brief look last time um, and hoping that the music might work this time and we can explore some more about her writings um, and the way in which they can shape and form us um, in our Christian lives. So details online as ever, um, go to the website for that. Thank you to Richard for his mastery um, of the technology this morning, and um, he's now going to take over and split us into breakout rooms. So if you would prefer not to head out into a breakout room, um, then I invite you to slip away quietly into the day. Have a very good week and look forward to catching up with you all soon. Um, any particular pastoral concerns, do be in touch with Michelle or one of the uh, ministry team, and we will follow that up um, and hopefully catch up with some of you shortly in the breakout rooms in a moment. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> 